All right. Um, where does one stand? Sorry. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, so this is actually one of my dissertation chapters um, that was co-authored with Steve. Um, and we thought it would be fun to present it today as an example of integrative research because we both happen to work in the same study area um, and we've actually been informally collaborating for a while. So this is uh, one of the projects oh, that we've worked on together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's not the clouds aren't moving. The clouds are supposed to be moving in this cool thing he did. Um, so what this, what this, whoa. <laughs> I'll keep talking. What this essentially, thanks. Um, what this, what the, what we're looking at in this chapter is uh, the idea of sustainable development policy and whether or not um, course indicators, which are often used to measure sustainable development success, whether or not those are actually indicative of true sustainability successes. So here we really take on this idea of forest cover and income. And often if you get increased forest cover and you get an increased income, policy considers that this big success for sustainable development. And so we're gonna look at a region, Costa Rica, that has been experiencing forest cover and see whether or not, um, uh, what are all the implications of this increased forest cover. So this is Costa Rica. Um, and as we zoom in, uh, yeah. Okay, so as we zoom in to our study area, it's gonna, there we go. <laughs> to, I'm really excited about this because Steve did all this, cool, all the cool stuff Steve did. Um, so uh, this is our study area in purple um, uh, for this research, and it's within this larger area that's called the Bellbird Biological Corridor. And what it is is a mixed-use region. Um, it's really a, it, it's not an official corridor in the way that most people think of that word, although it's official within Costa Rica and that often confuses some people in the committee. Um, but it, what it is is it's a target area for conservation programs. So things like payments for environmental services actually get targeted to these regions and the idea is to promote connectivity across what is primarily a privately owned landscape. Up here you have the um, a very well known uh, forest preserve called the Monteverde Cloud Forest Preserve. And one of the things I like about this region is it's really a microcosm for these larger processes that have been occurring at the national scale and also at the global scale. And so the way that um, sustainable development has really been occurring in this area is through decreased uh, agricultural, agriculture subsidies and increased um, kind of a, a focus at the national level that's really been promoting things like nature tourism as the uh, way to develop sustainably and successfully in Costa Rica. Um, and so within this area, beginning in about the 1980s, and those of you who know a little about Latin American history might know a little more than I can get into now, um, but basically a lot of agricultural subsidies were being cut and tourism was being promoted. Um, and it caused this boom throughout the 90s and really early 2000s in this area where the region massively shifted economically to more tourism basis. And yet you still have lots of small farms in this lower uh, area. Okay, uh, so these are, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my methods that I brought to the table and then Steve's going to talk about what, what he did with a satellite imagery analysis. Um, so many of you know I was doing about a year and a half of field work um, and just got back in July. Uh, and what I primarily did is I was working with landowners um, and there were three main methods that I used. I'm really going to talk about two of them here. Um, but it, well, I'm going to link, link, lump two of them together in the sense of I did ethnography and interviews, so more qualitative, um, anal uh, qualitative data collection with landowners. So here I'm doing an, an interview with landowners. Um, and then here is participant observation, so I'm participating in uh, apiculture, I believe it is actually, not apiculture, right, in English? Um, I'm participating in apiculture here. Um, although I'm mostly really just giving them a chance to dress me up and laugh at me because it was really small, <laughs> this outfit, and really hot. Um, and then down here I'm actually, I'm on a horse, but I'm actually mapping, um, I've got a GPS thing around my neck and we were mapping uh, the boundaries of this landowner's land. Um, and on the way we just happened to round up some cattle. So when someone asks if you know how to ride a horse, the proper answer in my case would be no, but uh, I decided to give it a try. 
So we processed two Landsat imagery from 1986 and 2014. Can you explain why we chose those dates? Oh, thanks. Um, we chose these dates because 1987 has really been often pinpointed as the year when Costa Rica went officially from net deforestation to net reforestation. Um, and at a theoretical level, that's kind of what we're engaging with in this, um, in this chapter. Uh, and also, it's a time when um, tourism really started to go on the rise. And 2014 um, is the year I collected my data. And it luckily coincides with having 30 meter resolution for both imagery. Prior to that, Landsat imagery was at a much higher resolution, so it didn't allow for an equal comparison. In these both cases, the vegetation is shown in red. We atmospherically corrected the data, and we used the vegetation index, and then classified it through pixels based on forest cover and resulting in uh, this forest map that eventually was used in uh, Karen's model. Uh, yes, so we don't, we don't show them here, but I had a bunch of farm boundaries from these landowners. I did a total of 87 landowner interviews, um, but I was only able to map 61 of the farm boundaries. Uh, it was quite extensive work, those of you who've mapped farm boundaries. Um, and so then within those boundaries, we ran some regression analyses and looked at uh, what characteristics, both biophysical and landowner characteristics, seem to best relate to forest recovery during, on their lands during this time period. And so here's our regression, um, which is, so we looked at the percent forest cover change across that time period. And then the um, equation, the, the final model that was our best fit model, uh, basically uh, considered forest recovery to be forest recovery to be a function of distance from river, uh, slope, the variability of the train. That's actually the standard deviation of the slope, the age of the landowner, their general attitude about payments for environmental services programs, which I'll explain a little more in a minute and then um, whether or not their only source of income was agriculture, which is a little bit more of a, an obvious um, one. So, uh, so what we found, so over here we have the results of the ordinary least square regression, and then we use that to go ahead and go um, use the same variables to do a geographically weighted regression. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar, what a geographically weighted regression does is it basically, for each data point, will rerun your regression, and so you can look at variability in your coefficient fit across your landscape. So with the ordinary least squares regression, what we found were that distance from river, so places that are closer to the river, had more reforestation, um, so riparian zones. Um, the age of the landowner, so older landowners, also had more uh, forest regrowth on their lands. Uh, more, ter more variable terrain was uh, preferentially reforesting. Um, people who only worked, got their income from agriculture, had less forest on their land. Um, and this last one, so the payments for environmental services attitude. So people who thought positively about payments for environmental services. This is not people who participated in the program. It is actually not even people who wanted to participate in the program, but just that they generally um, had a positive outlook about the program correlated with more forest cover on the properties. So then what we did, did you press it? Okay. There All right. So then what we did is to preserve the uh, anonymity, anonymity, I can never say that word, anonymity, I'm not going to try. Anonymity. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of, the, of the farmers is we, cr we constructed an interpolation map from the geographically weighted regression. Oh, I thought you were going to. The geographically weighted regression results. So Steve actually did the interpolation um, map. So did you want to? No, you already stole my. Stuff. Oh, I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you want me to? No, no. You're not gonna. Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> so we. Um, so Steve actually took the results from the geographically weighted regression that showed how well the coefficients were fitting for each farm, um, and then he constructed this, this, um, these, this map, which basically uh, what it allows us to do is look at the, co the coefficient strength and the predicted forest cover across the land. And so, and one of the advantages here was just so that we could get landscape perspective of what's going on, um, but the other advantage was also we didn't want to show our farms uh, to preserve the landowner. So what we ended up doing is we take the points of where the farms are with the data, and then uh, the interpolation when it does it kind of fills in the gap in between those farms, resulting in showing some of these uh, these trends. 
So what we found is that, um, well, we already knew from the first maps that Steve had done that there's forest cover increase, net forest cover increase across the study area. And what we found is that's pretty distributed across the study area, what's happening. Um, but that uh, the factors that seem to be driving forest cover are actually very different in different zones. And so what was interesting for us is that there's sort of this clear north-south division um, across the study area. So where this red area, that's the better fit of the coefficient, it's not actually negative and positive, they're all absolute values at this point. So um, it's just whether or not that coefficient is fitting the regression well. And what we found is that there's kind of a, a pattern here of these coefficients fit for this area a lot better. And up here, uh, this one fits a lot better. And this makes sense socially because this is the area that's primarily more agriculture and this is the area that's primarily more tourism. Um, and what we believe that these relate to is uh, an overall process of agricultural abandonment that has been occurring. And so what you're getting with your agricultural abandonment is intensification um, of the lands that are still being used in agriculture, right? So if you're still using your lands, um, then, uh, then you probably actually haven't changed the forest cover, but some people are using their lands just a little bit less and subsidizing their income from other sources. So they're leaving the rivers to reforest, they're leaving steep slopes to reforest. Um, and then this is with the older generation, um, basically that, land, that workforce isn't being replaced. Um, and I have a lot of uh, interviews that are pointing to this concern that there aren't people staying in production in this area anymore. Um, and so meanwhile, in this upper area, uh, the northern area by Monteverde, uh, what was interesting about this payments from environmental services, it kind of actually stumped me at first because it didn't relate to any clear behaviors. So I went back in the interviews and really was trying to figure out what's going on. And what it really um, relates to is a general attitude towards the changes that have been happening and primarily this idea that uh, Farm abandonment is ultimately a good thing because a lot of people were not happy about this process, but the people who seemed to like PES were on board. Like, this is okay. And the other thing that they were really on board with is this idea of getting payments for um, forest cover. And it, it, it kind of makes sense because if you're living in Monteverde and you're working in tourism, you're already starting to equate forest cover with money. And so while only I should mention 25% of my entire population liked PES, um, uh, the ones that did like it had that working better. Okay, so uh, then we continue to look more a little bit at tourism um, and what are people in general feeling about tourism? And what we found is that, uh, yes, people do equate tourism and these changes with economic benefits, they're equating it with conservation, and this seems like a win-win scenario, right? You're getting development, um, the positive things about development, and you're also getting more forest cover. But then we're looking a little bit more, there's all these other things that are going on with it that um, indicate a certain level of social disruption that's occurred with the tourism and maybe some other possible ecological uh, challenges. In particular, there seems to be a trade-off between um, tourism, the intensification of land use that happens with that, and water pollution. And then um, we know there's also quite a bit of issues in the area right now uh, involving uh, water loss and dryness. Um, there's actually protests about water right now happening in that area. Um, and so this is just a, a conceptual diagram to often when we think about development policy, we make our circle too short, right? And we look at, where, okay, forest conservation, tourism, and there's money there, and this seems to be a, a success. But what we're trying to do here is really get that circle bigger so we can think about all the trade-offs that are involved with tourism, and farm abandonment is a huge problem um, a factor in that, I should say, in the sense that it's causing a lot of changes and changes that might not indicate sustainability over the long term. Um, there's new problems that are being created. Uh, so um, the take home point is really that these gross indicators of sustainable development successes can actually be misleading and they can lead us to policies that might not be actually sustainable in the long run. Um, and forest cover, uh, as we know, is an insufficient proxy for conservation success, and yet it, it still continues to be used um, a lot. And then conservation policy focused on forest recovery may actually create new sustainability challenges. I'll skip that. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and Steve's going to do some really cool research with his dissertation I'm looking, to build on. I'm looking at 40 years, 1974 to 2014, and this kind of helps fill in the gaps and kind of understand what's going on with the forest or what's leading the forest change. 
instead of just mapping. And he's also been looking at like what are some other indicators you can use with remote sensing to density. understand tree density, to understand other types of ways the land might be used from a remote sensing perspective. And here's proof that we actually collaborate in Costa Rica. <laughs> Thank you.